London and Brussels are now still negotiating a future partnership. Or again, however you want to put it. But is three more weeks enough time to overcome the rifts? One thing is certain, EU Chief Negotiator Michel Barnier has little leeway. On Thursday afternoon, Michel Barnier left for London with a large delegation. After the British government agreed on Wednesday evening to continue negotiations on the future partnership, there was no time to lose. He now needs one, two, maybe even three weeks for intensive talks, so the EU negotiator was quoted from a meeting with the group leaders in the European Parliament before his departure. Actually, it has always been said so far, the end of October must be the end of October, so that Parliament can properly ratify a treaty with the United Kingdom on future relations. In three weeks time, it will be mid-November. But the Frenchman received a signal of support from all parliamentary groups on Thursday. If he needed the time, he would get it. Parliament President David Sassoli was asked to sound out the scope in the calendar of meetings. Internally, it has long been said that two weeks, well, just the two weeks of time, would be saved if the member states and MEPs did not allow an agreement to be translated into all 22 official languages. The work program that Barnier and his British counterpart David Frost agreed on Wednesday does not suggest that the talks will be concluded quickly. It is true that the 11 thematically delimited working groups should meet in parallel and that daily, including weekends. But work on a joint draft text is only now beginning. This next and final phase of the negotiations will in principle be conducted on the basis of the legal texts of each side until a common approach has been found says the negotiator's paper. You want to set up a secretariat with civil servants and lawyers in which the consolidated text passages are brought together. One thing is clear, the British are not ready to simply insert their change requests into Barnier's blueprint, as some in Brussels had hoped. But that also means that both sides now have to do in a few weeks what they had months to do under the exit agreement. Very early on there was a text version in three colors. Green for a consensus, yellow for a political agreement that still required technical clarification and white for everything that was still open. With each round, the number of white passages decreased. It is true that the negotiating teams have come so far in several fields that the outlines of an agreement are visible, as they say themselves. However, such compromises are only resilient if they are set out in writing. The politically most difficult points are still the same as at the beginning. The EU insists on guarantees that London will comply with certain EU standards in return for its access to the internal market in environmental and social law as well as in subsidies. Where this does not happen, there should be a resilient mechanism to resolve conflicts. Barnier has little leeway here. Many states would rather forego an agreement than expose their companies to dumping competition. And on the other hand, the EU position seems to be opening up somewhat on the issue of fisheries. Most states understand that they will be allowed to fish less in British waters in the future. Paris also recently admitted that. Will the situation be the same as it is today? Asked President Emmanuel Macron after the recent European Council and answered himself. No, that's for sure. Our fishermen know that. We know it too. We have to help them. In London, the resumption of negotiations was attributed to a change of heart, ultimately a buckling in Brussels. In a statement circulated on Downing Street on Wednesday, a government spokesman reiterated the points Johnson and Cabinet Secretary Michael Gove had made these days before as a prerequisite for further talks. Both had made it clear that a fundamental change in the EU approach would be needed, that the EU would have to talk seriously about all matters and accept to negotiate with an independent sovereign state, etc. We welcome the fact that Mr. Barnier has recognized both points and maneuver, and moreover, that movement is needed from both sides to reach an agreement in the talks, said the government spokesman. I don't know why the word maneuver pops up when I'm talking about Boris Johnson. London justified the return in the negotiating table with a speech by EU negotiator Michel Barnier on Wednesday morning. That parliament session, by the way, will be in my first premiere tomorrow with a very close look on the whole plenary session on Wednesday. So join me there. Barnier recognized important points 
for Great Britain, including respect for Great Britain's sovereignty and the necessary willingness to compromise on both sides. Barnier and British negotiator David Frost discussed this on Wednesday afternoon. Based on this conversation, we are ready to receive the EU team in London to continue negotiations during the week, said the UK government. Both sides agreed on negotiating principles according to which concrete treaty texts will now be discussed. To sum it up a bit, Barnier had called Frost on Monday and Tuesday. When the Frenchman then met the members of the European Parliament's Brexit group on Tuesday, he was already full of confidence. Talks continued on Thursday, he predicted. This suggests that his appearance in the European Parliament on Wednesday was closely coordinated with London. The Frenchman made no concessions on the matter. What he said about the sovereignty and red lines of the kingdom, he had said many times before. Barnier had once again offered London intensive negotiations in a speech in the European Parliament that morning, as I said. I think an agreement is within reach if we are both willing to work constructively and in a spirit of compromise. And as I said, I will talk in great detail about this session in the European Parliament in my first premiere on my channel tomorrow at 4 p.m. CET, by the way. From the EU perspective, there are only two to three weeks now left because the treaty would have to be ratified before the end of the year. The British side has also signaled its interest in a quick agreement because the economy on both sides is getting nervous. There are fears of a decline in trade, a disruption in supply chains and the loss of tens of thousands of jobs due to tariffs and delays at borders. Barnier said the EU is ready to step up talks and negotiate around the clock, including on the basis of treaty texts. He expressly reiterated the respect for the sovereignty of Great Britain, which was a legitimate concern of the government of Boris Johnson. The EU negotiator also reported progress in the negotiations, for example, with a view to future police and judicial cooperation. Here you can clearly see the outline of an agreement. In some other issues, despite disagreements, there is movement, such as movement of goods, services and energy. However, it's imperative to make progress on three complex issues. The level playing field required by the EU, the arbitration instruments for the treaty and for fisheries. These three points have been mentioned unchanged for weeks as sticking points. There was no change in content in Barnier's speech. He reaffirmed that the EU will stick to its position until the end. We will remain calm, we will remain constructive, we will remain respectful, but also firm and determined in defending our principles and the interests of each member state of the European Union and of the EU itself. EU Council President Charles Michel reaffirmed in the EU Parliament that the EU wanted an agreement, but not at any price. They offer access to the internal market, but insist on fair competition. We need solutions that are compatible with our principles, he said. However, it seemed sufficient to briefly point out that compromises are necessary from both sides to pave London's way back to the negotiating table. The British government interpreted the conclusions of the European Council a week ago to mean that the EU was not prepared to make any further compromises and that it was only London that was obliged to make concessions. They were also disappointed that, according to the official document, the talks on the future relationship should not be intensified as announced but only continued. Johnson took this as an opportunity to hold a televised address against the EU for refusing to hold serious talks. With the express rejection of a free trade agreement based on the Canadian model, Johnson's dream destination. The EU had effectively ended the negotiations it was set in London. On Wednesday, softer tones came from Downing Street. Barnier's willingness to compromise was significant, they said. Yeah, I haven't heard any of that. In a telephone conversation with British negotiator David Frost, he recognized the kingdom's red lines. In what is now an intensified discussion phase, they want to try together to bridge the remaining rifts. The government spokesman emphasized, however, that it was quite possible that the negotiations will end without success. Irish Foreign Minister Simon Coveney welcomed the continuation of the negotiations. There are no guarantees, but a trade deal to minimize the Brexit damage is possible, he tweeted. The time is now very tight, said a spokesman for Prime Minister Boris Johnson on Thursday. If no agreement is possible, there will be a hard Brexit without precise regulations for trading. Therefore, both sides have agreed to intensify the talks. That is why there will initially be daily advice from Thursday, including the weekends. At the end of the year, the transition period during which the UK still applies, EU rules, expires. 
After that, chaos threatens. That could hit the economy hard. New tariffs on many products would then be the order of the day. Issues that are particularly contentious are rules on fair competition, dispute settlement procedures and fishing quotas in EU waters. No, the UK waters. In the end, neither side wanted to make major compromises, which is why talks have stalled since the summer. And to come back to this often brought up topic, a diplomat told Reuters that fish quotas needed to be resolved urgently. The rest is more or less feasible. From an EU perspective, negotiations can take place until mid-November. And the reason for that with the languages I told you already. Then an agreement should be in place so that parliaments have enough time to ratify it this year. The British voters in 2016 voted with a narrow majority in favor of leaving the EU. Great Britain then left the EU at the end of January 2020, but is still a member of the EU internal market and customs union during a transition period until the end of the year. Only then does the economic break really come. The UK government stressed that the negotiations could still fall, as I said. But UK businesses, hauliers and travelers should definitely prepare because there will be changes one way or the other. The United Kingdom is one of the countries in Europe hardest hit by the corona crisis. On Wednesday, the day where everything happened, that's why I chose Wednesday, the authorities reported almost 27,000 infections, an increase of 25% compared to the previous day. Critics doubt whether Johnson can still control the situation. And if you now want to know more about European or global politics, YouTube has chosen another of my videos right here for you in the end screen, right next to your chance to subscribe to my channel. And I hope to see you on my premiere tomorrow. I'll see you in my next video first and then on Sunday on my premiere. <laughs> Click and enjoy. Viel Spaß.